Paul just reminded you there. Um, a few weeks ago, our church announced that our whole focus for the year would be on the church. Uh, we're going to be doing you know, some Bible studies uh, on our teaching hour as well uh, and various other activities probably over the next 18 months looking at the topic of what is the church. Um, there is another study book that's actually uh, we were considering um, to use for the house groups and it's entitled Church, Do I Have to Go? Now, yes, you do have to go. Um, but as we look into this whole series of focusing on what the church is, what does it do, how does it behave, what's its practices, we felt as elders that it would be prudent to focus on, before we get to the practicalities and the behaviours of a church, to discover what is the heart of a church. Really, what is it the, the core of a church? And you can't begin a study on the church without talking exclusively about the conversion of the people within the church. So we decided to tackle the quite sensitive topic of conversion. We've all experienced in some ways and heard in some way the gospel preached to us and known at that moment that we, that we are the wretches that were spoke of and that we needed the saving power of Christ. Each of us all have come to Christ in our own way in different ways in which he has spoken to us. And for that, we have to be truly sensitive as we talk about this subject. Because as we look around, there'll be people who perhaps in the past would have proclaimed faith but are no longer with us, have went out from us. We have to be sensitive to all of these things. But what is it that makes a church? What is the heart of a church? Well, it is the converted, regenerate, saved, discipled, holy, distinct, summoned, assessed, and charitable hearts of those who come together as the body of the church. That is why we are continuing in our series examining conversion. Conversion is of chief importance within the life of the church, and it's amazing that how it has been relegated to perhaps obscurity in so many churches. How much do we much of this service and much of this um, series will be reflective upon our church and ourselves. It will ask hard questions of ourselves. It's easy for us to point out the window and say them. It's much, much harder for us to say us. But how much do we, as the body, seek the validity of conversions of those who come to join with us? How much do we seek out the resulting, transforming power of the gospel that was spoken of this morning? In the life of the church and its people and what it does. In order to do this, we must have a correct understanding of conversion. So we begin there. And we'll do so carefully through our studies. But hopefully you'll raise those questions yourself. And more importantly, our hope has always been that you'll have assurance of your salvation. Assurance, not a false hope, that you will know these things to be true. Much has been said in recent weeks of the sincere faith of the SNP First Minister candidate, Kate Forbes. News articles have carried stories often citing the term her sincere faith. And whether it is an attack or defence, they raise the question often, can sincere beliefs be held by ministers who govern us? When you consider that statement, you, you'll know it itself to be foolish and somewhat paradoxical. After all, it is the litmus test for the self-centred, self-focused beliefs of this world all come down to one key word, sincerity. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, is what you would hear. Oh, aren't they sincere? No matter the belief, and after all, is that not the standard of the church and other Christians that we made professions of faith and we were sincere? Were you not? You see, I grew up uh, at a time within the church, and perhaps I don't know what other generations faced, I can only speak to mine, um, at a time where 
Youth culture was heavily influenced by the practices of larger churches. It was not unfamiliar to go to a youth event and see en masse an altar call, a call to the front, come and get prayed for, raise your hand, stand in amongst a congregation. And with all sincerity, many, many young people would stand up and they would profess their faith and love in Christ. But all too often we'd see them fall away. It wasn't strange to see some what perhaps you would look back on as manipulation on the behalf of the youth speaker who would quite carefully construct what he was saying in order to generate an emotive reaction out of young people so that they would turn to Christ purely out of emotion. I know there's some here that perhaps maybe know what I'm talking about. How many times did we see the Brian Adams, Jesus of Nazareth video? Countless. Countless. And none of these things you could say, well, that's not bad. Well, it is if it only leaves you with sincerity. And from it, we would see the continual cycle of those believers who would be called to rededicate their lives again and again and again wanting to demonstrate their earnest faith of how sincere they were with their belief. The depth of our sincerity. No, 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 no. This time, I really mean it. I really mean it. And soon after, those doubts would then creep in and then uncertainty would then plague you. Was I sincere when I prayed those words? Would be the question that would be asked. And then that cycle would turn to anxiety, which would then be debilitating for a believer. And all too often you would see young people, and people you maybe even know, would lead lives apart from God. Wouldn't seek after him. The reality often being, not that I wasn't or many that aren't or weren't sincere, but the huge elephant in the room was this. The one that we never speak of. They were not saved. They were not saved. And it is so hard to say those words. But it could be the truth. You see, scripture does not proclaim everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be sincere. It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved. You see, the first word on the converting power of the gospel is saved, not sincere. And tonight we're going to work out a few questions together so that it's clear to us all about being saved. We have to understand what we are saved from. We're saved from and what we are saved to what and for what purpose. As we turn our Bibles to Ephesians 2, we're going to stay there for most of the night and explore these questions. If you are saved, what does it mean? What does it mean? So turn there with me. And reading from verse 1. Because firstly, we have to understand that we, the people of God, are saved from God's wrath we are saved from God's wrath and in Paul writes this to the church in Ephesus and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at the work in the sons of disobedience he goes on he tells us who does this include among whom We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. He then tells us that it makes us something. He says, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, Kate Forbes was admirable standing up for the scriptural positions on sexual sin. But could you imagine if her response had been 
by your very nature are deserving of God's wrath. The debate on her faith in the public sphere was disappointing and concerning. That you're not permitted to hold biblical views on these matters. It's not surprising though, was it? It wasn't really a surprise to us. But you know what it was? What really was? The lack of understanding in our position before God. As if the view on sexual sin was the most offensive thing you could find in scripture. Not at all. The most offensive thing that you can find in scripture are the words that Paul writes here. By our very nature are deserving of God's wrath. You see, we as a church, we need to be courageous in this, in, in this regard. As this has a subtle tendency to be watered down, this is the piece that we just keep under the carpet or hide behind, you know, when someone's coming to your house and you just get the dirty laundry all stuffed into the cupboard. This is the part that the Christians take and stuff into the cupboard because we know to speak these words is difficult. It takes courage. Is our message from Westwood Hill that Jesus saves you from a purposeless, unfulfilled, meaningless, unhappy life? These things are subjective. Or is it that you are saved from the wrath of God due to you because of your unlawful, sinful acts? We need to understand together that we are not saved from subjective problems. Subjective problems is where you often then go and sub seek a subjective solution. I'm overweight, I'll go to the gym. I should pray more. I'll get up earlier. I need financial advice. I'll go and see someone who knows about financial advice. I'm unhappy. I'll go and make myself feel better by buying something that makes me happy. Or I'll, I'll go on holiday. That makes me happy. These are subjective problems. We are not saved from subjective problems. If we think that, then we'll seek a subjective saviour. Clearly understand this. God's wrath is pointed at the sinful world and the people within it. Now I know that in years to come to say that will likely be understood as a hate crime. To read out the words that Paul has written, our modern world would class as a hate crime. But it's part of God's word and it's the truth. And we must consider it if we are to consider our own, our own conversions. And if we are to call anyone to Christ, we cannot shy away from it. We are saved from God's wrath. Now let us continue and read the verses of Ephesians 2. And we find out that to be saved from God's wrath, it will have to be by God's grace. It'll have to be by God's grace. From verse 8, he writes this. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. That is the incredible gift that you and I have been given, which is the forgiveness of those unlawful acts, of that rebellion, of the sins that we talk about, and definitely the ones we never talk about. That is what he has saved us from. And he has done so by his grace. Purchased by Christ's blood on the cross. Taking our place, substituting himself for us. You see, in grace in a person's conversion always comes first. Always comes first. Because it firstly challenges our moralism. It confronts it head on. I need to clean myself up in order for God to save me. I need to be right. How many times have you heard that? I need to be right before I can go and find God. That's how the world thinks. It's a twisted thinking that Satan tells this world that no, 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 no. 
he, he expects people to be good before you can come. He expects them to be right before you can seek him. Lies. Or what about the other one, which is perhaps maybe more prevalent in our own world? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not me. I haven't done anything wrong. Not me. I don't need Jesus. Not me that needs him. Okay, that's good for you. You perhaps maybe need him, but no, I'm good. Thanks very much. Pride, the first sin. Thinking that there is nothing to forgive. Ah, I'm sure all of us. It will never. Take, it won't take too long to find something. It's the misunderstanding often of these two things that Christians get themselves confused with, with how we are saved. We often mistake these things and confuse and switch them round. Can view it as this. For it is by faith you have been saved through grace. It's not what the verse says. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And when we confuse these two things and we swap them around, we get trapped in that idea that it is sincerity which is the goal. I need my faith to be enough to be saved. If I can just be sincere enough in my faith, then I will be saved. That's not what the verse says. And this can become even more problematic because then you just think of a single event or an action that encapsulates your faith in entirety. I prayed a prayer, I went forward, I raised a hand, you may have done those things and I don't decry them at all. But if they are the only thing, and you might get yourself wrapped up in that confusion where you think, did I do it right? Was it correct? Was it enough? Well, that's you thinking it was by faith that you have been saved and not by grace. And you have to switch them around again. Did I mean it? Do I still mean it? You must have a right and proper understanding of this. Grace comes first. It's what is we as a church need to pursue. To pursue God's grace. And my faith, perhaps you think like this, my faith has elevated me to the position of the deserving poor. That's what Piper calls it. He says it's the position of the deserving poor. Where all of a sudden I have become visible somehow to God because I've cleaned myself up a little bit. Or I've taken the first step forward where he's also having to take steps forward. It doesn't work like that. We don't move. We were dead in the trespasses and sins. <laughs> the people don't move. Okay. Also, faith in scripture is never measured by a scale of intensity. You had this much and they had this much. No. Faith is trust. And is only as good as the object of that trust. Ask yourself this question. Not did you, not, not did you believe, but who did you believe in? Who did you believe in? It is not of your own doing, Paul writes. So what then does sincerity matter? If it's nothing to do with you. The truth is as liberating as it frees the Christian from this very idea. The one curse that the church falls under again and again. This idea of performance. Performance. It's crippling. We are freed from sin to live, not to perform. Not to perform. And so many Christians get themselves wrapped up in this idea of, I need to perform like a Christian and not be a Christian. I need to perform and do the right thing so that God may love me and not realize the truth that he loved us all along. Now, if we continue again uh, and reading in the verses in Ephesians, 
Let me find my, my space there. Once you realise this, then you do get to move into that next point that is encapsulated so beautifully here in Ephesians. It asks and answers the question that many people ask, why does God save sinners? Why does God save sinners? It's because he loves them. But God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now if you're in the habit of underlining things in your Bible, underline these verses. If you're not in the habit of doing that and you think that's sacrilegious and you should never do it, then just write me a note at the back of your Bible then that this is where this is. Okay? Fundamental to our Christian faith, to the gospel. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. You see, it was his choice. You never read anywhere in scripture, and so God loves you. You don't read it. You prayed the prayer, and so God loves you. You turned up every week, and so God loves you. You said the right prayers, you tithed, you did all the charitable work, and so God loves you. You will never find it. What we call this is we call this his election. It's his choice. He's the one that gets to enter the voting booth and decide who to cross against. Election. He gets to choose. And understanding our true condition before him helps us in this regard. So if I can borrow from another great preacher called Paul Washer on this very subject. And if we speak about God's love devoid of his wrath, then it can sound very much like this. Friend, don't you know Jesus loves you? He loves me? Yeah, he loves you. That's great. I love me. I'm, I'm my biggest fan. Are you telling me he's also my biggest fan? That sounds great. I'll have that Jesus. He wants the best for you, friend. Funnily enough, I want the best for me too. I'll take that, Jesus. It's not what scripture says. But God shows his love for us in that we were, while we were still what? Sinners. Christ died for us. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And what? In love. You see, if this choice that God makes is based upon our love of him, how quickly then we'll seek performance over grace. Yes, I mean, I don't know, hold on. Like, I know you love Jesus, right? But I really love Jesus. I, no, no, no. Trust me, I love him more than you do. I really love him. I know you try hard. But I try harder. You heard that before? Performance. We do it all the time, don't we? Even in the most innocuous things. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. I am the Rangers fan of all Rangers fans. Me. I'm at every game. I do this. I do that. Me. No, 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 no. You, look, I know you know about gardens, but I know about gardens. I can make anything grow in any soil. Performance. And we as Christians do the same thing. He prayed the best prayer. He said the best words. It's nonsense. It's all nonsense. It is not what God designed for us. 
It's not what scripture says. He loved us first. I'm reminded of that small portion, and I will I'll share this. If anybody wants to link to this, it's probably one of my favorite sermons. You might think to yourself, do you actually do any study for this, or do you just watch other people's sermons? Um, this is a great sermon by Alistair Begg, a friend that we all we love and know, who explains this ever so clearly to a group of people, this truth, making it clear. If you were to be asked the question, why are you saved? What would your answer be? And he goes on and he says, if you start your answer with the word I, you have immediately went wrong. You're off piste. If we start our answers with I did something, then we've messed up, we've misunderstood what's happening in Ephesians 2. He talks about and says that it's he. The first answer that comes out of our mouth must be Jesus. Jesus reached into the depths. And then he goes on, he has quite a funny bit, and I'll maybe try and share it with you. I find it funny anyway. Um, and his unique style explains how this might have worked out for the thief on the cross. And he says he wants to go and find him when he gets to heaven just to work out how did this all pan out for you, man? Like, one minute you're on the cross, you're with the Saviour, and next minute, heaven at the gate. And he kind of says that, you know, he's obviously going to turn up a bit perplexed, maybe even confused <laughs> why he's there. Um, and when the angel maybe asks him, well, what are you doing here? And the thief might be saying, well, I don't know. <laughs> I've got no idea. You know, and maybe the other angel comes along, gets his pal, and they come and say, well, um, can I just clarify, can I, what's your understanding of the doctrine of justification? Um, do you know about the doctrines of scripture and election? And, you know, the thief is probably, I don't know what you're talking about. Never been to a Bible study, never went to a church. Met Jesus for all of their three hours during one of the most excruciating moments of that man's life and the Lord's. And now he's in heaven. No, no wonder he's perplexed. And then Alistair has the cracking line. I'll never forget. Um, and I've written it down in my Bible because I'm, I'm deaf. I'm pinching it because it's a great line. Um, frustrated, the angel asks him, on what basis are you here? Because that will be the question that we will be asked. On what basis are you here? And the thief replies, the man on the middle cross said I could come. That is the very essence of election. The very essence of God's love for us. He decided and said we could come. You could come. And you may say, well, that's great. The Son of God decided that you would come. You must be great. No, 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 no. I'm the chief of sinners. And he said, yes, anyway. I'm horrible and wretched. And he loved me despite all that. That is what Ephesians 2 tells us. That is who Jesus is. Okay, let's keep going. Because there's so much more than that. If that hasn't blown your mind enough, there is so much more than that. So we've been saved from God's wrath. Saved by God's grace. Saved because of God's love. But we've also been saved into God's people. Through his work, he's delivered us, as scripture tells us, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. Into a royal priesthood, we read, tells us again and again, once we were not a people, but now you are God's people. You have been saved into God's people. Paul in Ephesians in the first half has explained the implications of personal salvation. What does it mean? How does it work itself out? What is the truth of it? And now in the second half goes into the corporate implications. What does it mean 
corporately for us as a church in verses 11 to 22. It's often entitled, One in Christ. We have been saved into one body from verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he, that he, might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Succinctly put, in reconciling himself, us to himself, he has simultaneously reconciled us to each other. And what is clear from these verses is that it's in the past tense. It's written in the past tense. It's not aspirational. It's not something that we aspire to be. It's something that we are. Practically, it works out like this. We are together. That is who we are. We are together, unified together in the body of Christ by him. Now, some would argue you don't find membership of a church in Scripture explicitly, but it is implicit. We are to be together because we are together. Bearing with one another, Paul writes, and here perhaps you can see the reason that any focus on the doctrine of the church that we want to have throughout the next 18 months or so must begin with the focus on the very conversion of the people that are called together to be together. Each one of us, as it underpins all that follows in the church, baptism, we would declare that conversion to the whole world. The Lord's Supper, because we are converted, we're invited to share together. Church membership, we serve and care for each other because we are bound together. For each other. You see, conversion connects us to Christ and his body, and the very practical connection to both the global church, Paul declares in verse 19, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You are saved into a holy temple for the Lord. That is the purpose of the church. And in this last verse, you see, Paul makes this a local imperative. He takes something that's global and says, but it's also local. He addresses the church at Ephesus directly in verse 22. He says, In him, you, talking about the church in Ephesus, are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Westwood Hill, in him, Westwood Hill, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Addressing the local church. That is our purpose. We are being built together for a dwelling place for the Lord God himself. By his spirit. I wonder if you think like that when you get off at nine o'clock, maybe nine o'clock, who am I kidding? Seven o'clock on a Sunday morning uh, and as chaos reigns, you think I need to get to church. I'm going to the place where God by his spirit is building his own holy temple. And amongst the people that call themselves the church. Do you think like that? Do you see yourself like that? We're built like that for this town. 
I'm sad to say, though, I think it could be any churches and perhaps even ours. For many, something, churches that you attend but don't belong to. Not together. Here, but not together. And it's perhaps maybe because we don't understand something of what God is doing with regards to building his church. We often misconstrue it and we think it's less about building and more about maintaining. God is building his church. God is building the church here in Westwood Hill. You see the very evidence of that every week. It's friends that come from international places. People who come out from the streets. I can't tell you why they're here. But God is calling them here. People of all walks of life, of all cultures, all colours, all expressions will come here seeking the Lord. We're not doing that. That's not us that's doing that. We think it's us then we're fooled. If you think it's the elders that have got some sort of grand plan around that, then you're sadly mistaken. You give us way too much credit. Finally, as we end, Paul writes that this church, he calls it something, he says, this is the new man, something new. It's unlike anything the world has ever seen. And its very existence, therefore, cannot be associated with what the world deems as successful. In actual fact, everything the world tells us about being successful is almost antithetical as how the church should actually behave. By ourselves, we are incapable of revealing of how God has reconciled himself to us. We're incapable of doing it. Have you ever tried it? Explaining it to someone. It's hard. It's hard because the cross of Christ, Scripture says, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Give it a go. Let me get this straight. God, in order to make a way for us to be called his children, sent his son to die in our place, taking our sins and punishment on the cross, rising from the grave, extending to us the new life that he now has. And in that life, we find forgiveness and peace. So that in turn we may be his holy temple of peace here on this earth. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. I know this person I used to be would say one thing. Prove it. Prove it. That's the gospel. Prove it. Show me it. Sounds like fancy words. Yes, we alone cannot reveal how God has reconciled himself to us. But we can in the church. The very purpose of the church. Not even the global body of the church can do that. It's mysterious that we all call ourselves Christians and we're spread across the world. And it's great to see that God is advancing his kingdom throughout. But even that can't explain to you the gospel can't do it only the local church can only the local church reveals the truth of God's reconciliation in the people that are in the church how is it that those that should be enemies are now the deepest of friends those from all walks of life that we talked about they join to love one another and their goal is to forgive one another. When sincerity runs out, we find a people who continue to love regardless. Regardless. That is who we are. That is why God has built the church in order that we may express that reconciliation to the rest of the world. Jesus himself says, they will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. That is the truth. It's the true mark of a converted people, one that seeks not their own glory, 
Not their own cleverness or their own pride. Look how big our church is. Look at all these great people that are coming. It's wrong. It's one that seeks God's glory. He's doing it. He's calling people here. Asking them to come and hear the gospel and repent. It's not fancy words here. It's not clever programs or social nights or X, Y or Z. It's him. All the time. Who but God could have done this? So that the world may gaze upon the church and marvel and praise God himself. Enemies that become friends. People who wish to forgive one another regardless of what they have done. You see, these are the truths that we express to the world. That we're saved, not sincere. Saved and not sincere because his work, the work is not ours, it's his. He is the rescuer and we are the ones who are rescued. We are the ones that are at sea that need him to reach we are helpless and gone. And we continue to do that for those that we see. This is what we should seek for one another in conversion. Have, have you been rescued? Have you been rescued? Let me just finally return then to that famous description because this is the, the thing you hear all the time of the early church in Acts 2. And you often hear as it's, it's written in Acts that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread and the sharing of everything that they had with one another. And many people will say, when, do you know what? It'd be brilliant. It'd be brilliant if we could just get back to being that church in Acts chapter 2. There's some of you smiling. You've, some people, you've heard that people say it. I know this to be true. And when you think about this, reflect upon this, they were not sincere. They were saved. They were saved. And that is the difference. If we want to be a church like that church, then we need to seek to be saved and not just sit and be sincere. We need to be saved. As we're saved from his wrath, saved by his grace, saved because of his love, saved into his people and saved for his glory. This is what it means to be saved. Amen. Now at this point in a sermon, someone might say and give an altar call. Would that not be the right thing to do? I don't think so. But if you have heard these words, and it may be surprising and think, do you know what, I've never thought like that. I've always went on my own power, my own steam, my own sincerity. And I don't know if I'm saved. Then this moment amongst the people who God calls together to bear with one another and love one another sounds like the right time to actually get that sorted out with people who actually care about you, who love you deeply, who will be sensitive to the very truth of that, not scorn or admonish, even though you might think, oh, what an embarrassment I am. I've been pretending at this for so long and I wish someone just said it and I could just say it out loud. That might be you, it might not. The person next to you might be that person. This sounds like this place is actually the right place to sort that out and amongst those people who love you. If you want to do that, you don't need to raise your hand, come to the front, say anything, just go and speak to someone. That is what we're here for. Let us pray. Lord God, before you, we know that we are sinners. And sometimes, God, we feel like we are the chief of sinners. That we have, in some way, separated ourselves from you again with that one sin. But we know that your word speaks truth. And that by the blood of your son, and it was the, the grace that you extend to us, that you call us home again and again and again. 
extend to us the forgiveness that we do not deserve, all because you love us. What amazing words to hear. What amazing truths to be encouraged by, to be restored by, to be reconciled by, knowing that you have extended your hand to us, given us life. We give you praise and point all the glory to you. Was it I? No, it was you. Did I take the first step? No. You called and made me alive. Called me to yourself. Father God, I just pray that if there are any amongst us here or any who listen days after this online, that they won't sit in embarrassment, they won't sit in anxiety, they won't be crippled by the lies that Satan tells them, that they're a fraud, because those are not your words. Your words are ones of love and of grace. Extend to them, Father, those words so that they may know that they are saved as you have reached out to them. For our church, Father, teach us what it truly means to be saved, that we may be, be able to express these things to each other in love, that we may care for one another. That we may lift each other's burdens in, the such, in such horrendous and difficult times. Forgive us, Father, where we are negligent with one another and crass with one another. But it is not the way that you have taught us. Teach us to be loving and kind and gracious and generous to one another. So that the world may know that it is not us but you and that you may be praised. In your most holy name, amen.